Hi, I'm Hans Stärk. We're from Technical University of Munich, and this is our work on using attention mechanisms and language models to predict where a protein appears inside of a cell. And we've made a bit of a leap in accuracy for these applications, so let's get into that. Okay, why do we want to know where proteins locate inside of a cell? Why is this an important problem? Well, I think it's fair to say that proteins are really the workhorses of life and they make all kinds of functions happen in our body. And we are made of cells, our cells are made of proteins and these proteins just do about anything that's happening in our bodies. And if we now want to know how a protein functions and what it does in our body, which is important for drug discovery or all sorts of medical applications, then it's really important to know where a protein locates inside of a cell because that determines their functions to a certain degree. So we want to know what a protein does. And for that purpose, we need to know, is it in the nucleus? Is it in the ribosome? or like in the cytoplasm. So the problem we have here is actually a classification problem, the problem of subcellular localization prediction, where we have maybe 10 different location classes inside of a cell, and we want to know to which of them our protein belongs. Okay, but then what is our input? Like we, we have this protein right here, maybe, and we want to know where it locates. Okay, but then how do we represent this protein on our computer? Well, proteins are really just a long chain of different amino acids. So this big molecule, a protein, is made up of these small molecules called amino acids. And of these amino acids, we have 20 different ones. So every protein is just a long chain of 20 different amino acids that then fold up into this complex structure that gives the protein its function. And we now give every one of those 20 amino acids a letter and yeah, just write those amino acids in a long string and that is the representation of a protein and the input that we're dealing with. Okay, then let us get to our actual method. The first step in our approach, which we can call learning the language of life, is to train a large language model on these protein sequences. Really very similar to what's commonly done in natural language processing, except that now instead of a sentence, we have a sequence of amino acids, so our protein sequence, and instead of individual words or word pieces, we now have single amino acids. Then we pre-train our language model with our protein sequences, either with some autoregressive objective or masked language modeling, as I illustrated it here. And just as a reminder, in masked language modeling, we just mask out certain tokens. So in our case, amino acids, we mask out amino acids of our sequence. And then the pre-training task is for the transformer to reconstruct these tokens that were previously masked out. And this way, our language model basically has to learn some sort of understanding of what a realistic protein is or an understanding of protein sequences. And basically, given, given the context of, of the sequence, it has to learn what is a likely amino acid to be at this position depending on what surrounds this position. And in this fashion, we pre-trained two language models, PROTBIRD and PROTT5, which are transformers. And we also have one LSTM-based language model that was pre-trained in an autoregressive fashion. At this point, I quickly want to highlight how much pre-training data we actually have available here and on how many sequences we can pre-train large amount of protein sequences are actually cheap to come by because there has been so much sequencing done in the past. And for that reason, we are able to train on this large amount of protein sequences, like the 2.1 billion sequences, which maybe for context is about 400 billion amino acids and stored as text on a disk. 
it takes up 500, around 500 gigabytes of disk space. So there's really a lot of sequence data out there. And fortunately, we're able to leverage this with our approach. Then we are now done with our pre-training and have these language models that are able to capture information about proteins in their representations. And what we do now is we just take a sequence for which we want to make a prediction. We feed it through our transformer and then we just have an embedding at a certain layer of the transformer, just the activations at a certain layer. And we use that as our protein representation. So we can now generate these really expressive protein representations. And we're using those for our downstream predictions instead of the protein sequences themselves. So the first step in the approach is always to take a protein sequence and generate the embedding, which we then use for our downstream predictions. In our specific setup, we're using the last layer of the transformer for our embeddings and the dimensions for our representations that we end up with is 1000 by 1024 by the length of the amino acid sequence, the length of our protein. So the size of our representations right now depends on the sequence length. And we could, for example, process them further by just taking the average over the length dimension, and then we end up with a fixed size representation, which we can then put into an NLP to make our downstream classification prediction. Another idea could be to just have an LSTM operating on this sequence, but we found this approach to overfit very quickly and work quite poorly. So what is our fix for this or what is now our method. What we came up with is this light attention architecture where we also take these protein embeddings of our language models as input and we produce a classification output. And the method is really simple. We only have four learnable weight matrices here, one in the convolution and another one in the second convolution and two in our MLP. And the attention mechanism that we're talking about here is not self-attention and we're not quadratic in the sequence length. So how does it work? Well, we just take our protein representations and have one convolution running over them to produce these attention coefficients so we call E over here. Then we just normalize them over the length dimension using the softmax function, and we end up with these attention values. Then we just have a second convolution also running over our input features to produce our values over here. We then just take the element-wise product here of our attention and our values to produce this representation down here, of which we then just take the sum over the length dimension. So really, we just end up with a weighted sum where the weights are given by these dynamically constructed attention values. And after the sum, we end up with a fixed size representation down here. And we concatenate this with additionally taking the maximum over the length dimension of the values, just feed this to our MLP down here and end up with our final classification scores. Then what do we evaluate our method on? Well, we have this deep log data set, which is probably the standard data set for subcellular localization prediction. So maybe what ImageNet is for images, this is for subcellular localization prediction. In this data set, we have these 10 different location classes. And we can also see over here that they're really unevenly distributed and we have very high class imbalance. So we train on deep lock and evaluate on the deep lock test set. But besides that, we also create this new set hard, which has a different class distribution from the training data set. And it has much less sequence similarity to the training data. So it's much harder to make correct predictions for it. Now let us look at some results. What we can see here is just the accuracy 
of different methods evaluated on the dblock test set in light gray and on our newly created hard test set in dark gray. And in orange, we just have the accuracies of previous methods and the purple methods, those are the ones operating on our language model embeddings. Also, that dashed gray line over here, the horizontal gray line, that shows us the accuracy of the previous state of the art on either test set. Then, first of all, what stands out, our best method, that's light attention trained on our PROC T5 language model embeddings, it performs eight percentage points better than the previous state of the art on deep load test, and also eight percentage points better than the previous state of the art on the hard test set. So that's of course a nice improvement, but what I also want to pay, point out is if we just go with this approach of averaging over the sequence length and then using an MLP right here, we can also already be 4% better than the previous state of the art. So these language model embeddings are really super expressive and we can already with the simple MLP approach improve upon the state of the art. Now let's have a quick look at what happens if we use other methods on our language model embeddings. For example, if we use the LSTM of the previous state of the art over here, we can see that the accuracy really drastically drops. And this is the case because the LSTM just immediately overfits. So to operate on the language model embeddings, we really need an architecture that is not very expressive itself, but light attention is still able to look at every position in the sequence and it can assign the right attention to each position in the sequence to efficiently aggregate all of that information and make good downstream predictions. Another interesting point is the embedding space of our language model embeddings and what we have here are two UMAP plots where the individual points are colored according to their localization class. And in the top plot, we just have the original language model embeddings, average them over the sequence length to end up with this 1024 vector and project it into our 2D space with the UMAP and plot these individual points. And we can't really see any separation of the proteins according to the localization class. But that was basically a weighted sum of our features using a uniform weighting. But if we now instead use our attention coefficients as the weights for our weighted sum, then we end up with this bottom UMAP plot, where we really have much nicer separations. For these two classes, for example, we almost have perfect separation and maybe there's also a really good separation for this class up here. So the attention coefficients that we have learned here are really able to assign the correct importances to different amino acid positions such that we can efficiently aggregate the information from the correct positions, which are important and informative for our task of predicting the subcellular localization. Now, let me quickly summarize our method. We first train these language models on large amounts of sequence data. Then we use this language model to obtain very expressive representations for any sequence that we like. This representation is then used as the input to our light attention architecture that is very lightweight, but able to attend over the whole sequence and pay the correct amount of attention to each position in the sequence. With this approach, we're able to beat the previous state of the art on the standard benchmark, but also on a new created test set with harder targets and less sequence similarity. Lastly, I want to invite you to head over to embed.protein.properties and throw any kind of sequence you like at our web server to let light attention make its state of the art predictions for the subcellular localization. Additionally, you can get lots of other predictions and everything for arbitrary amounts of sequences. Also, the code for light attention is on GitHub, including all the model weights. And finally, I want to say many thanks to my co-authors and remember, 
that protein language models are awesome.